preparing to live stream the meeting. <laughs> Setting up your meeting. And a new one's gonna open up. You can take him. <laughs> We're going live now. Thank you, dear. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't be able to focus if I had to keep. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh, <I'm so> <laughs> no way. Now I'm sending the message. Okay. So we are live right now. People can see us. Okay. That's fine. But let's see. Now I need to go back. back to bed. All right. Here we go. Okay, I'm going to turn it on on my phone. Thanks, honey. You turn it down. All right, there we go. So we'll be going out now to all the women. Okay. All right, I will let you know. All right, hopefully, let's see if people can hear us. I got your text message. <laughs> oh, you did? Did it go through? Yeah. Awesome. yeah. <laughs> Let me hear if I can hear us on here. Yep. Okay. Matt said he can see and hear both of us. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. That's what I wanted to confirm. Hello, guys. All right. They're joining in now. See, I know once I send that text message out that, you know, I see people just start joining. So it's really nice. Yeah. Okay, so everyone, good to have you. As you can see, I have a special guest tonight. I don't know how much we'll get to cover. Her name is Mrs. Sarah Wallace. Um, many of you have probably seen her. I had her on a lockdown episode months ago, and then uh, Brother Paul has also had her on a couple times, I believe. So can you just start it out by telling us, telling us a little bit about you, your family, and then just your experience in the, in the field that you've been in? Sure. Okay. So, um, I am a mother of four. Um, we were just talking about that from mm -hmm. ages 19 to 19 months, basically. And, um, I'm a registered nurse. So I've been in the field for about 10 years. Uh, I started out in psychiatric nursing, which I've did about five years working as a psychiatric nurse in an inpatient hospital, predominantly with adolescents and children. And then I moved into home health care and eventually transitioned into hospice. Uh, presently, I'm, I'm working at a hospice uh, agency where we go to the homes and provide care to those that are actively dying in the home, as opposed to in a facility, um, a hospice facility. Uh, during this time, I also did uh, nursing education. I worked for about five years at a local community college where I provided nursing education to nursing students regarding mental health, um, which is where a lot of my background comes from as far as my knowledge in this space. Um, yeah, I think, that's, I think that's in a nutshell. <laughs> Very cool. But I really wanted to have you on. At first, it kind of started about um, I really liked your perception or your, you know, your view of the lockdown. I was kind of picking your brain about that, but since this is a channel geared more towards moms with kids, you know, I kind of wanted to delve into just mental health when it comes to bonding with your children, especially, you know, for newer moms. Um, I don't know. This was not, I, I feel like a lot of the attached parenting um, has been recent. Do you, do you feel like, you know, the phenomenon of the attached parenting has kind of grown in the recent years, not so much the way we were raised? You mean like, um, skin to skin or what are you, what do you, yeah, thinking? like just even bonding in the hospital, you know, the golden <laughs> hour bonding in the hospital, uh, co-sleeping, you know, uh, baby wearing that's, I feel like that's a newer concept. Yes. Yeah, it is definitely newer. Because I um, know my mom was not raised that way. <laughs> no, no. And it's kind of all evidence-based. Um, so that, you know, the, all their research is called evidence-based practice, where it's just basically they watch a bunch of different people and see that if they do a certain thing with a certain group, it presents a certain result as opposed to not doing it with the other group. Um, so... 
there's so many variables involved in that, but uh, for the most part, um, there does seem to be, I don't see that there's any harm in the things that they are presenting. That being said, um, I don't know if it's entirely necessary either. Um, and I can just kind of jump into that. But um, so I feel like in so many ways, uh, God has blessed us with natural abilities and, and um, birth is no different. Um, exactly. You know, our, our bodies respond to uh, the, the process of labor and even after labor, our bodies know naturally um, how to respond. Uh, I mean, science calls it instinct. I call it God's, God's right. plan. But any new mother can say that having a baby is transformative. Um, and it's because when that baby's first born, you have an uncontrollable desire to protect that child, no matter what, mm -hmm. like this child that's only been in your life for hours, um, not days. And you're willing to throw yourself in front of moving traffic to keep that child safe. So that's, uh, kind of scary for somebody that's never felt that about anyone before. Um, but that's uh beneficial in the fact that it's protection for that child but so that's um a, an instinct that comes naturally to us but there's other things that we don't even really think about that are instinctual for example um you know or naturally you speak in a higher pitched tone mm -hmm. uh when you talk to a baby and you repeat yourself yeah. um and so science has shown that young um infants cannot hear noises in lower decibels which yeah. nobody really knows that but everyone just naturally knows to speak in this higher more friendly tone i don't talk to my baby the way i'm talking to you you know we always talk in that higher pitch tone we repeat ourselves uh often saying the same things over and over um and that also that repetition is uh how they develop language skills, the basic fundamentals of language skills before they're even able to comprehend what the words mean. Um, so everything is um, you know, just uh, this child, this baby is just absorbing everything that they're, that they're being exposed to from birth and, and absorbing at an ac accelerated rate that uh, once they reach the age of one, kind of declines and continues to decline for the rest of their lives. So it's really astounding what they're able to pick up in such a short amount of time and how we know to react to them. Um, babies themselves also have instincts that um, help with their survival and help with their development. Um, for example, they have different reflexes that they're born with that the nurses, when they take your baby away, and they're doing all these things in the corner, they're checking their reflexes, their startle reflex. If you ever have a baby kind of go like that when they when they get startled. Um, oral reflex. Yes. And um, the rooting reflex, which uh, fun little experiment when your baby's born, if you just caress her cheek, she's gonna turn her mouth towards it because they know that that's what uh, a nipple feels like. They know to turn towards a nipple without you teaching them. The, the ability to suck they know how to suck when they're born so these are all survival um instincts that a child is born with but they're not born attached to their mother mm -hmm. right. everyone says you know that to do skin to skin um that they they recognize your voice um these things are true they recognize your smell um but these are things that reinforce safety but not attachment. There's a stages of attachment in a newborn um, that are pretty much universal, no matter where you're, what country you're in or what culture you're under. Um, I think they've studied them in, in almost every culture out there. Um, but the first six weeks of life for a newborn, they just want human contact. And that's why when you have, a, you can play past the baby in the um after the er because they don't care who's holding them they just want to be held they, right. they feel that comfort being held by a human um after six weeks and and going towards six months they form more specific attachments they're able to identify mom and dad um and and brother and sister um but it isn't until about seven months of age 
do they recognize their primary attachment, which is usually mom. And that's the one that that's when separation anxiety forms, right? When they, they want to be with that primary attachment. And then it's not until about 11 months of age that they start to get more comfortable with um, people outside of the, the, the inner circle of attachment, right. mm-hmm. um, friends, uh, extended relatives, and so on. So it's definitely um, a process of stages of attachment. And when that is compromised in any way, that can influence and impact uh, long-term their ability to properly form attachments down the road. So those first, that first year, or at least the first 11 months, those stages of attachment development, if they uh, lose that um, path or if it's interrupted, like they are removed from their parents um, or there's a death, heaven forbid, um, this can impact their ability to uh, attach properly um, with other people. What do you feel is the most important age in, um, like, as far as time frame for just healthy mental health when it comes to um, children? Because I know we're going to get into neglect and, you know, how that affects children down the road. But it's crazy to me that if there is some type of neglect that happens within the first year, that can impact their entire life. Yes, no, that's definitely crazy to me. So uh, when, when does it start becoming detrimental if they aren't given, you know, the love or the care that they need about what age or. Well, I mean, if they, the first six months of life, if they don't have proper attachments forming, it's going to affect them to some degree. However, the longer that runs, the more of an issue it is. And um, I mean, this is, a, we're, we're kind of talking about uh, reactive attachment disorder right. and, and what that means. And I don't want young moms yeah. to be alarmed and think, oh my gosh, right. if I put her down and let her cry, yes. she's okay. going to have an attachment problem right. in her later life. This is, um, of the social deficit disorders, this is the most uncommon. And this is the only one that can be directly related to trauma. It's directly related to a level of neglect. And I can give you examples of that in a minute, but I do want you to understand that there's different levels of, uh, or different um, types of um, social deficit. So there's ADHD, which is um, hyperactivity and impulsivity are the main uh, symptoms of that. Um, Autism, which is, yeah, unable to form attachments um, with people as much as you can with objects and uh, sensory overstimulation. And then um, reactive attachment disorder, which they're able to form attachments, but they're usually superficial attachments. So um, they kind of all present in a, same, a different way because the ADH kid's gonna be bouncing off the wall. The autistic kid's gonna be playing in the corner and the rad kid is going to come up to you and ask if they can call you mommy. So those are the, that's uh-huh. kind of the simplified version of how they, they're going to present. Um, the rad kid is always the one that is in, fo- they're, they're almost always in foster care. And when they're in foster care, they get placed into a new home and they immediately attach to the family mm-hmm. and, you know, mom, immediately staying mom, dad, um, the family's thinking, I don't know why all these other families had such a hard time with this kid. This kid's right. great. The yeah. school says, oh, this kid's great. I don't see what the problem is. Um, but then the longer they go, they stay there, the more that they have issues with the, uh, the attachment process. And then they become more um, impulsive and aggressive mm-hmm. because of it. So um, this all kind of came about the first... Uh, I don't know if it was the very first diagnosis, but the the largest um, case group that they've ever had of reactive attachment disorder occurred in Romania. And this was all a part of the communist regime in Russia. And um, when that all fell apart, they found that there were 
so, tons of orphanages just filled with kids. Mm -hmm. I think they said around 100,000 orphans. And there was not the staff to comprehensively care for these children. So they um, were basically left in cribs from... I read about this. Yeah, yes, I was talking about. Mm -hmm. From birth to like eight, maybe. Yeah, they were left know. in cribs to, and basically um, they were fed and their diapers were changed. And that was the only interaction they had with humans um, and, and, and each other. Because sometimes there was multiple children in one crib. Mm. But um, as a result, they just developed bizarre behaviors. They were feral a lot of times and um, incapable of speech. Mm. They um, reactive attachment kids, depending on their level of neglect, depending on the level of um, lack of comfort that they're receiving um, and uh, lack of attachments being formed with family, um, they learn to soothe themselves by strange means. And then that kind of carries over as they get older. Right. So they have often bizarre, bizarre symptoms that you see right. uh, when they end up in the mental health system. Mm -hmm. So um, there was another case also in uh, Los Angeles, of Janie Wiley. Um, she was strapped to a potty chair during the day. And yeah, then, see the bunny hop girl? She would hop yeah. the bunny. Yes, I, that story is crazy. And she, um, yes. she was able to learn language. Uh, no, I misspoke. She was able to learn words. She was able to learn right what words meant, but she wasn't ever able to develop language, develop uh, sentences. So, I mean, originally they thought once, if you're not t taught a language by the age of five, you'll never learn it. And that's right. not necessarily the case. You can learn the words, but she was never able to put a full sentence together or formulate um, a comprehensive conversation with somebody. So it definitely impacts your, your um, ability in that way. Yeah. I remember I've, I've been fascinated by this subject for a while. I, I've watched a lot of the old, um, they actually did some old black and white documentaries about this subject, you know, just showing how the kids were almost, um, that were put through where they would just lay in the cribs by themselves all day. They were retarded. They, it slowed their brain growth. You know, they, yeah. they just, they didn't know how to speak. This, most of them, they can't roll over. They can't hold their head up, you know, just horrible things. It's very sad that they would even be allowed to experiment like that with children. <laughs> yeah. You know, and this is back. These are old, old black and white movies, but it breaks your heart watching it. Cause. Yeah. Well, and I saw an old uh, experiment where they took a monkey, a baby monkey and separated him from his mother and put him in a room with a metal cage. Yes, I've seen this one too. I've like watched yeah. the same things you've watched. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, they had a metal cage that had a, a bottle and then they had another metal cage that had like fur on it. And every single time the monkey would choose the fur, yeah. the furry cage as um, as a surrogate parent. So they, they always seek safety and comfort before food right. and sustenance. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the same with um, with babies as well. They are the most able to thrive when they are in that safe and comfortable zone. Um, I know I mentioned to you the, the stages of hierarchy, the Maslow stage of hierarchy. Um, your ability to develop is based on what stages are being met. So the very basic fundamental stage is safety. Um, and as long as your safety is being met, the next stage would be um, sustenance. And then from that, you, you feel love and belongingness. So um, you cannot have these feelings of love and belongingness if you don't feel safe right. and if you, you don't feel properly fed or reinforced. So um, mm -hmm. it's crucial to make sure that that safety level is definitely met first um, for all these other things to develop. Mm -hmm. So what would you describe a healthy relationship looking like, you know, between parent, baby, child, et cetera? Well, um, there's, 
there's different i don't want people to feel like they have to have uh baby in arms 24 hours a day right exactly. you know, when i was younger yeah. i went back to work when um when my babies were six weeks old and mm -hmm. i put them in daycare at six weeks old i regret that now and i feel like my attachment to them to those two my two middle ones aren't as well bonded as my attachment to my youngest or my oldest my oldest daughter i went back to work when she was a year old mm -hmm. so i had that time to really formulate a good bond with her yeah. um but even that being said they all still uh they're, they're growing up okay <laughs> you know so even if you make the mistakes in hindsight and I, I can only see it in hindsight now you know turning 40 I realized that some of the things I could have done differently um but they at the time I, I didn't think anything of it you know yeah. they all learn and that's the yeah. thing too I mean every there are no perfect parents and um we might get into this a little bit later but you know I I know that kids have fallouts from upbringings and things but I feel like there comes to a point in your life where you just have to move on from some things. Yeah. I mean, because there are no perfect parents. Every parent has baggage. You know, every adult, you know, every, you're going to have something that's happened in your childhood. <laughs> so, you know, it, and it's I'm a lot different about, now than yeah, like, if we, if we think back to when we were, yeah, when we were growing up and it certainly is like my mother said to me, that they told her not to give um, my brother any food, anything other than breast milk until he was a year old, which mm -hmm. just stunned me. <laughs> I thought, oh my goodness, a year without food, like he would be ravenous, but yeah. um, that's kind of what they were teaching back then. So <laughs> yeah. um, it's just, uh, and even before that in, in the, uh, the, the golden generation, they, they taught them to um smoke cigarettes while they were pregnant <laughs> so it's just i know um it definitely changes generation to generation you know yes it does now as far as to answer your question uh, and there's different ways and stages to show a healthy attachment between um parent and child so with a baby, I, I, I think that the strongest thing to say is to not to ignore <laughs> anyone who says, oh, don't hold your baby, you're going to spoil him because nobody says as much as they used to. But with my first daughter, everyone said that to me. Um, yeah. you, know, you hold your baby too much. You should you should just let her cry, let her cry herself to sleep. And I, I just couldn't do it. I don't know if anyone can You can pull your hair out listening to your baby cry for a half an hour. <laughs> it's horrible i know <laughs> um so it's good to just it's it's good to just show them that it's okay to cry and 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 get over it um but not to let them cry too long so when they're first newborn and they they cry i say respond to them right away as right. they get older uh like the toddler when they start to walk and stuff if they hit their head or hurt themselves and they start to cry give them a minute to see if they can do it on their own before coming in because if you don't give them that moment to try to self-soothe they're not going to develop that ability to self-soothe and then they're going to constantly need you to um reinforce uh safety uh that they can't find on their own so oh I'm going to write some of these tips down that you're giving. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And like I said, if you don't do this, if it, if it messes up, that's fine because they'll figure it out. It yeah. just might be a little harder. You know, that's where you get separation anxiety because these babies weren't able to properly develop an understanding of um, self-soothing and that's safe. Um, my son, my problem is I didn't want to leave him alone when I went back to work. So he would go with me. Like I travel from house to house to house. So he would stay in the car and I would be with him in the car. And then I go in and then I come back out. And so I thought in my head, you know, even now I'm making mistakes. Cause I thought in my head that this is just showing him 
that I'm with him. You know, I'm with him as much as I can be. And he knows when I go away, I come back. But all I really was doing was just um, like tripling the separation trauma. So every time I left, he was upset I was gone. And it didn't occur to him that in a half an hour I was coming back. And it didn't occur to him that it was only a half an hour I was gone. He just knew I was gone. So it would have been a, a lot better if I had just left him home and he would have only had to deal with that once as opposed to five times a day. Right. Um, so now he's just, as soon as I get up, he's, he's watching me. If I, <laughs> if I go anywhere, he's right behind me because he doesn't want me to ever leave um, because it was just so hard on him to have that happen over and over and over again. So I'm dealing with it myself. You know, <laughs> as I say, I don't want anyone to feel like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm a bad mom. And that's the first thing you always think, you know, that, oh, I messed up. I'm a bad mom. And we all have the best intentions. Um, and we all deal with mom guilt all the time. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, we do. I don't know. So. Do you, I feel like, I feel like when moms are dealing with mom guilt, that kind of just shows that they care a lot, you know? Oh yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. They, they are, they want to be the best mom that they can be. <laughs> it is hard work. You're always second guessing yourself, you know, but I feel like that kind of just shows that they care about their children. They love their children. You know, they want what's best for them. So, and everyone goes through these stages where I know there was um, some saying that I saw before how, you know, at this age, you want to be with mom at this age, you, you wish she'd just go away at this age you think you're better than her. And then by the time you reach a certain age, you think you can't live without her. So you know what I mean? I can't yeah. explain it that lib, but um, it's kind of, there's a lot of truth to that because as your kids progress into childhood, they um, learn to kind of forge their way on their own. And then they come back to you as reinforcement of safety. And then as they progress into teenager, they start to find safety in Com their other companions right so they can still come back to you for the the last ditch effort of safety but then they also find safety in those around them and develop their own community um which you want i mean it's healthy for them to be able to take what they've gotten from you and go and develop their own family their own community and then flourish in that way um and then they reach adulthood and when they start having their own children sometimes i won't say all the time but sometimes these uh little girls especially think that they got it figured out more than mom does and um you my son i mean my not my son my husband when we had our son my husband dealt with a lot of um anger towards his mother that she didn't do things that he felt that she should have done for him that he's doing for his son mm -hmm. so you start to see that and compare mm -hmm. um and then after that you come to terms with it and then i feel that's when you form that lasting ultimate bond that <laughs> that, that carries you through the rest of your life so oh, there's I, always stages yeah. that the mom has to go through and endure with their babies because they're not always going to be that cute little bundle yeah I can totally see that and now we've raised kids up through adulthood you know our oldest will be 19 like you I'm kind of in the same boat as you I'm almost 40 mm -hmm. and then your oldest is 20 my oldest was is going to be 19 in a couple months and I've seen that go full circle, you know, and now that he, it's like, um, now, now he's come that entire circle. So it's kind of cool to see, you know, the different stages that your kids go through for sure. So <clears throat> what is, okay. So have you ever personally dealt with babies or kids that have had, um, severe attachment disorders from neglect or, you know, anything in their past? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah um what are and some, uh, what are some of the like the symptoms of that or okay so <laughs> universally they all like i said are the ones that are the most um uh, amiable towards you when you first meet them mm. and then over time they deteriorate as far as their behaviors they're not able to um, they, they, they get impulsive and they have a, a defiance to them. They, they don't understand um, that they have to compromise with people. They want what they want. And so 
being able being told no is a huge trigger for so many of them i we hear uh all the time they, they don't like to hear the word no um so it's hard too for the parents because uh or the usually foster parents right. because um the community resources don't understand i mean the kids are doing great for them so we don't usually see the more extreme behaviors unless they're with us for a long time which we had some kids that were with us for six months you know inpatient inpatient psychiatric hospital for six months and then and then you see it and it says oh okay now we see but um they do much much better when they are in this revolving door where they don't have um one person that they stay with very long which is unfortunate because that makes it so that they're never able to fully develop relationships with anyone they they lack any type of trust in anybody because everyone's just going to leave um but aside from that they each kind of develop their own personalities based on the circumstances of their trauma um i had mentioned before about a boy who he would he would eat until he threw up and then he would just reconsume everything he threw up which was Uh, weird his uh, mom had to lock all the doors in the the cabinets in the kitchen um and just completely regulate his diet because he couldn't stop himself from binging right there was another boy that came from russia who was very um attached to pull-up diapers Mm -hmm. um he only felt safe when he wore pull-up diapers and he was actually uh getting into a a teenage he was he was like 16 by the time I started working with him and they they had him in the process that he was to the point that he they had weaned him off the pull-ups but whenever he had um an anxiety inducing situation he would want to go back to them so instead of going back to his social system or his mother or you know, uh, finding support in those things, he would find support in wanting to wear pull-ups. And I know there was this one incident that he was digging in the trash at a mall and found a pull-up diaper in there and, and put it on like a used yeah. pull-up. So, um, so yeah, they, they just do bizarre things <laughs> basically. They're, they like, there's a lot of stuff as far as urination and and excrement Mm -hmm. that um they do like um there's a boy that he cut a hole in his um, mattress Mm -hmm. and he would um defecate in it and then cover it up with towels um or that he would uh urinate into the food in the fridge and then put it back in the fridge and i'm thinking if i was that mom man she put a bed alarm on his door and not bed alarm a door alarm on his bedroom door because he would sneak out at night and do this weird wacko stuff so um it's just uh odd things uh, definitely socially unacceptable things and that's usually um just because these are the things that kind of manifest as a result of them self-soothing by some means because they didn't have the comfort they desired from their parents Do you think a lot of that has, I mean, this is obviously going back when it's to this extreme, this is going either back to some serious neglect or serious abuse at the beginning, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, very serious. (laughs) Yeah, it's usually neglect. It's like left in the crib, left to not eat, you know. Um, I don't, I can't fathom what makes a child want to keep their poop in a jar you know i don't (laughs) hide it in a vent in the heating vent i don't know what what causes that but for some reason that's what maybe and i think well maybe they were spanked if they had a dirty diaper you know maybe that i don't know but for whatever reason that seems to be what's formed as a comfort for them Mm -hmm. so these kids like the the one that um with the mattress he was adopted when he was eight months old wow so um this kind of all developed prior to that which is prior to eight months old is what wow yeah that what led to these things um that had to have been very severe 
usually yeah. if they just are neglected to some extent because a lot of times what happens a mom has a baby they may get postpartum depression or they might have a drug issue and that baby just stays in the crib that's mm-hmm. usually what happens they don't feed them the baby stays in the crib usually fingers crossed cys gets involved rather early on there is a process though so the babies are taken and put into foster care while a plan of action is developed with the parents to say okay to get your daughter or son back you have to do this this and this and demonstrate these things and then you can have your child back so in that point in time you know that baby could be three months old it could take the parent three months uh, to show that those things have have occurred so those are three very pivotal developmental stages of life say the foster mom's doing everything she can to be the support to that baby well then that baby goes back to original mom bio mom right it loses all attachments it's developed with foster mom and has to reform attachments with bio mom and so already they're kind of behind the eight ball it so to speak right. But if that was the only time that occurred, they still may have a good chance of um, working through it. It's when they are in that crib for a year mm-hmm. and um, or they're they're abused and neglected for so such a long time and then completely pulled away. Um, I think with that boy, the eight month boy, the mom was was um, jailed. So there was no. Um, he was immediately eligible for adoption for whatever the situation may be. Um, so there was no fostering. There was no uh, possible reuniting with the original bio mom. Um, so th- th- in those situations, that's when you have these more severe um, responses, but it takes a lot to push the human psyche. Mm. It's, it's not usually a one incident thing that puts someone over the edge. It's built up like a house of cards and then um it takes a bulldozer to knock it over sometimes right i mean are there any are there any um treatment options for kids let's say someone's looking into adopting and they know that as a baby you know they went through serious neglect is there are there treatment options for the for those parents yeah the earlier that you know the better like we have a great um adoption program in my church Mm -hmm. and um the family that kind of heralds that they just brought on a baby who came from a crack addicted mother so Mm -hmm. she was born addicted to drugs and um they have her in physical therapy because i guess you get muscle rigidity from the drug addiction i didn't know about this but it can actually stunt your ability to, to to crawl to reach your milestones basically um because you have this uh muscle rigidity from the overexposure to opiates in the womb so um the fact that they had her in physical therapy right away is giving her best shot and the same thing with mental health you know they have her with speech therapy too to try to help her to develop those articulating skills that she may have lost in those early stages and they got her when she was three months old so wow. this is um early interventions but that's because they had a full knowledge and understanding of what they were getting into if you start to see some weird things going on with your adopted child or your foster child all i can say is it's better not to ignore it not so much with your biological child because you know where that child's coming from you know my daughter thought she was an alien for a year (laughs) you know, that's, that's not something I would worry too much about when you know they're, where they're coming from. <laughs> but when you don't know those early months uh, where, right. where their, their source is, then it's good to just be proactive with that, to get that help early on, um, to get them into the system. Um, and that's a situation where I'm not always a big advocate for, I'm certainly not an advocate for medication in children. I am strongly opposed to that. Um, and I'm not always an advocate for therapy because I feel like a lot of therapy should and, um, could be done with the parents and should be in a normal developing child. But with somebody that has reactive attachment, they have some component that is lost to them as far as 
those healthy developments of attachment that you need to have some sort of uh, professional help to just develop a plan. With all these social deficits, ADHD, autism, reactive attachment disorder, the universal best treatment is structure. Um, the structure is based on the child and the need and the severity of the condition. But structuring your home life, um, so if you bring them into your foster home and it's already structured, you know, they already have a chore calendar and a schedule and they wake up every day and they eat the same um, type foods every morning and you, everything is the same every day, then they will have a higher likelihood of thriving. It's when things are kind of chaotic um, and there's no plan from one day to the next that they really struggle. Um, another good treatment is diet. Um, yes, I really wanted to cover this. I know yeah. this one thing you didn't get to cover with Paul is yes. about diet. So Could I kick myself for that because it's such a huge thing. <laughs> Yeah, but it's more so with these kids. Um, for some weird reason, there is a sensitivity in these social deficit kids with certain types of foods like gluten. Mm. For whatever reason, they can't tolerate it. And uh, red dye, yeah, red dye forty. Yep, red dye. They don't like the red dye. So yeah, anything artificial yep. um, is lost to them. They just it causes them to become so often it causes them to become violent um that they become more wild impulsive crazy wild um that they they just can't be controlled and so much better they do they do just so much better when they are on a, a diet of natural plant-based products um less carbs less uh, gluten less wheats um they just naturally thrive that you don't need to have uh a bunch of medications to up and down them you just put them on this um, structured diet, structured home environment, and they, they excel. So it's not, um, it's not impossible. I, I just feel like, unfortunately, they don't fully comprehend or have the full spectrum of joy of forming um, uh, a lifelong attachments. I feel like it, it's something that um, they may develop into adulthood and understanding of, but it takes a lot more than it should have to for them to comprehend it uh, and a lot of times if they don't find a family that can help them to grow and if they just keep weeding their way through the system mm -hmm. in and out of different foster homes in and out of different psychiatric facilities they usually end up with uh, personality disorder like borderline per personality disorder which yeah. um the worst thing you can do <laughs> parenting tip from from me is um reinforcing negative behavior mm -hmm. which is what forms a borderline personality disorder uh, basically what that is is um you know, baby uh little little boy says i want a cookie you say no you can't have a cookie he says i want a cookie you say no you can't have a cookie he throws himself on the ground i want a cookie kicking kicking screaming okay take the cookie just shut up and get out of here that's reinforcing Exactly. negative behavior mm -hmm. so borderline personality people and i'm kind of going off on a, a limb on a you know, i'm very not interested. a rabbit hole I'm very <laughs> so please keep going yes uh, borderline personality disorder is people who don't know like if everything's fine yeah they don't know how to function in that sort of setting so they are always doing self-destructive things to reinforce attention so they're they're the ones that you know, everybody's getting along. They lock themselves in the bathroom and, and says, everybody hates me because they're not getting enough attention. So then everyone gives them attention and that's reinforcing their, their negative action. And then they come out and they're fine again, as long as they keep getting that reinforcement. It works great when they're little kids. You know, um, if you have a little kid who's performing, uh, doing something negative and being reinforced in a positive way, and it could be something more subtle than, flipping out on the floor because you're not getting a cookie it could just be like i said crying in a corner because you're not getting enough attention so they're doing a negative thing to reinforce attention upon them and we want to help them you know um but then it kind of accelerates so if they don't get attention the way they want it so let's say they're crying in the corner and and they don't get a response right away they'll amplify that behavior um 
and before you know it they're throwing a chair across the room it's like okay pay attention to me so so many times when we've had an escalation in inpatient in an inpatient hospital it always started with they wanted a snack or they wanted to watch this movie or they wanted a one-to-one time and but all of these things are them getting um some sort of attention and when they don't get that attention when they request it they they escalate and they keep escalating until they get the attention and unfortunately then they get restrained (laughs) so it's not such a good attention but anyway so if that keeps happening where they keep over and over and over again learning that they just have to keep escalating and eventually they'll get what they want Mm. they're going to develop that into lifelong personality traits where as an adult they start to do that and it's not so cute anymore um so so how would that manifest as an adult in situations well those are the people who relationship situations yeah they they never form long-term relationships or if they are in a long-term relationship is very destructive so they um they do better when they uh have reasons to be upset Uh because then if they have reasons to be upset then it's okay for them to be upset and get that attention when there's no reason for them to be upset they they usually manufacture reasons Mm -hmm. um so okay here's an example we (laughs) when i was inpatient we had um, an extended uh acute unit these were people that we would have for years um a lot of them had borderline personality disorder so one of the girls was actually getting discharged and everyone was congratulating her. They were having a goodbye party because she had been there for two years. And uh, another girl was jealous of this. And this other girl had a nut allergy. So she went around to all the couches and was digging in the couches, trying to find something to harm herself with because self-harm is one of the most prominent symptoms of a borderline patient. Self-harm, all this, all the time, all of them is self-harm. Um, because if they can't have, like I said, if they don't have a reason to be upset, they will manufacture a reason. So they like to self-harm. Anyway, she was digging around trying to find a reason, something to harm herself with, like a paper clip, a staple, whatever. And she found a cashew. Oh no. And scampered off to her room and just rubbed it all over her face. Oh, no. And then said, I did this. And then they had to send her to the hospital, which they love to go to the hospital. They love to be on one-to-one. So they're constantly saying they're suicidal when they're inpatient because they love to have somebody yeah. sit with them all the time, give them that 24-hour attention. Like we had another girl. Personal attention, hours. Yes. And hours of personal attention, 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 attention. It's so dead. And it all manifests from when they were younger and not having the attention when they wanted it. So they had to keep escalating and get to get the attention with this negative behavior. So as long as you um, give them uh, an equal portion, I'm not saying constantly pay attention to them, but don't ignore them um, when they're in need, then that doesn't happen. Is this all like from destructive or abusive relationships in their youth? Right. Yeah, that's crazy. I've been in the ministry a long time, so I've dealt with a lot of people with (laughs) personality things, you know, you get every type that comes through. So it's just, this is why it's so fascinating to me because I like to study people. I like to kind of pick their brains and, and then, um, you know, a lot of, I've noticed a lot of people with a lot of these type of personality issues, they do have a lot of baggage from childhood. Yeah. You know, just the way they were raised, which is why it's, also fascinating to me and it kind of shows me what to avoid with my own kids and you know I always wanted a close relationship with them as they grew up and and I believe for my family I think the safety has always been priority and security knowing that you know they were safe in our home and their parents were together forever and they didn't have to worry about uh, you know different <clears throat> they they've always felt secure I guess is what I'm trying to say. So yeah, it's always been really a top priority with me when it came to my kids. So that's very interesting. No, I'm very interested in that. (laughs) 
<laughs> well, whenever somebody asks me, like my students would say, what, what's the type of patient that you wouldn't want to work with? And I always say borderline, borderline. Pain. Oh, they just make my I, eyes roll. Like, no, oh gosh, what did you do yeah. now? <laughs> I think it's one of the toughest. Um, yeah, it's one of the toughest things to treat. And, yes. And people with borderline personality disorders, do they even realize that they have it i mean isn't it hard for them to even realize they have it they do i mean to to an extent they realize that they have it but they don't realize why it's a problem because it's comforting to them um these behaviors give them the attention they want and that attention is what comforts them so they don't understand why everyone has a problem with it <laughs> basically they don't understand why everyone abandons them like their family doesn't come to visit them and stuff and they just um so it's hurtful for them and then that makes that just re-escalates the whole issue and and they have to be willing to identify that it has to start with themselves and as long as they're willing to blame others and not themselves for the situation they're in they'll never develop the skills they need it's actually um Oh, I can't remember. There's a specific type of therapy. It's been too long. It's out of my head now. Uh, but they, they have to go through this specific type of therapy. And evidence-based practice has shown that it's been helpful in treatment of borderline personality disorder, but it takes six months of commitment. Mm. And these people want results so much sooner than that. Mm. So then they get another diagnosis tacked on so they can get a medication mm, yeah and then they go right to that but there are other self-harming things um do you often see with these type of disorders do you see um addictive personalities too like addictive traits with them as as far as like when it comes to self-harm or you know addictive even- traits you mean like um compulsive like drugs, like drugs you know getting into drugs things oh. that would harm them but you know, okay not well really like cutting or yeah know, C- cutting in itself i mean these things are coping skills whether they're healthy coping skills is another thing but cutting i mean that's a whole other subject i don't know how if you want me to get into it but there are reasons why people cut one of them is as a coping skill right. um it's called there's a concept called mindfulness which is basically the practice of being aware of your physical surroundings to remove yourself of your mental surroundings. So when you're in the midst of having accelerated anxiety, the therapists go through this rehearsal of mindfulness. Um, though a lot of times like they give them a frozen orange, for example, and have them hold it in their hand. And then they tell them, you know, focus on the texture of the orange, focus on the coldness, think about the smell. You know, they have them just really just fiddle and focus on this orange or, um, you know, going into a shower. This is a, this is a natural, normal response with mindfulness. You had a stressful day. How many of us go and take a nice hot shower Mm -hmm. after a hard, long day? It helps us to have this physical sensory to remove us from the mental anxiety. And then we come out feeling refreshed and so much better. And it's that whole concept accelerated. So they have a a higher level of anxiety than we would normally. And they try to give them a a higher level of sensation, physical sensation. So um, they they try to practice that with, uh, I don't even remember where I was going on with this now, but (laughs) mindfulness is one of the biggest things that they, they try to teach with the personality with the borderline people mm-hmm. it's just the mindfulness yeah mm-hmm. what was your question because i i was going somewhere with it oh about if they get into if people with that disorder get into self-harming things or addictions oh know? yeah yeah okay oh yeah okay the addiction that's what i want to talk about mm-hmm. um so um when they don't have these other things to cope like mindfulness is a healthy way of coping right another concept of mindfulness is self-harm. So if you don't have a cold orange to focus on, you know, a lot of times they will cut themselves. Self-harming only maybe, I'm just throwing a percentage, a small percent, like 5% of the time is actually with the intent of suicide. Right. Most of the time 
it's for a variety of reasons, but one of the main reasons is because it helps alleviate anxiety, which is a bizarre concept, but it's true. When you're cutting yourself, you're feeling physical pain mm-hmm. and you don't feel what's going on in your head. And that's why, um, I don't know, sometimes you have these, these people that pick fights mm-hmm. um, to try to get hit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know if you've ever heard of it. Like they, they want to get into physical altercations right. with people. Right. Because feeling that pain helps distract them from the anguish inside. Drug use is the same thing. So we call it suppression. There's different defense mechanisms. Mm -hmm. And one of them is suppression. And and that's just, you use drugs, not because you have a personality disorder, but because you want to forget whatever it was that caused that personality disorder. Mm -hmm. So they will, yes, very often get involved with drugs, but not because of them being borderline. It's because they, well, it's because they're borderline, but not because the borderline traits, but more so because they want to cause them to be borderline, whatever trauma they went through, they want to forget. And unfortunately, our mind has, um, you know, anxiety is not an unhealthy thing. Mm-hmm. Anxiety is another gift from God to designed to show us that to heighten our senses. When we're anxious, we are very aware. And so when you think back to walking in the woods and getting jumped by a bear, as opposed to driving down the street, you know, we have these days, but we're back, back in um, the times of, you know, foraging in the forest. If you feel anxious because something isn't right, that heightens your senses. So it makes you more aware of your surroundings and protects you as a survival mechanism. So unfortunately it's become more of something that we're trying to suppress all the time as opposed to finding ways to cope with it in a natural, healthy way. So everyone's just you know, popping the pills instead of trying to find ways to accept and cope with this anxiety and work through it. Um, but the, uh, the inability to, to deal with the anxiety and to work through the causes of it for these, these people that have had trauma, it's just easier for them to uh, take care of when to forget about the things that, that, um, that cause that anxiety in the first place. And because they're not dealing with it, every time they get anxious, they get these visions. Um, maybe not always visions, but a lot of times with these borderline people, they, and I don't know how much of it is an act to Cassie because they act a lot, but they get these flashbacks where they start to, shout out like stop hitting me daddy and it's like are they really is this really happening or are they just i don't know it's it's called dissociation um so they start to dissociate and and so they they're just going right back into these things that trigger the anxiety because they're not coping right with the thing that triggered it so every time they get anxious it it regurgitates Mm -hmm. and so they just keep quelling it with drugs and alcohol or whatever it is that they're doing to quell it. And that's the thing they go back to. So yeah, it's a long story short, I get long winded, but it is definitely um, something you see prevalent with these um, behavioral types with these personality disorders. If you're dealing with someone that has these issues in your life, what is the best way for you to help them? Or what is the best, when do you need to, you know, what is the best way for you to help them without without um what is it um encouraging the bad behavior you know what i mean well it depends on how attached you are to that person all of us probably have these people in our lives so yeah so if it's someone you just met at church and you start to see that i mean you you just starting to get to know this person and they're acting a little borderline-y yeah which i mean i can tell because (laughs) i've seen it so often yeah yeah sad to say i just remove myself immediately i'm just like okay that's i will not my, be friends with that person yeah that's kind of my go because it takes so much exhaustive commitment they're yeah. the people that will show up at your house at 12 o'clock at night bawling yeah. i mean it takes exhaustive commitment to to really commit um to being a friend with that type of person and unfortunately they don't have many friends and it's just their family that they have and maybe um a child or two and um (laughs) ex-lovers and that's about it you know they don't really have um if they are in a marriage well bless the husband or wife that they're with but Mm -hmm. um 
if it's somebody that's a family member that has unfortunately developed these traits, right? You can only you have to be firm with them. Again, it's structure. So if they call you up, and this is usually how you interact with them, you don't hear from them for six months or maybe less. So we don't hear from them for a while. And then when you do hear from them, it's because they're in a crisis mm. and you have to set firm boundaries with them to say, we talked about this. I cannot have you in my home because you cannot be trustworthy. I will help you. I will talk to you on the phone. I love you and I can support you as much as I can this way, but I cannot have you around my family because they'll lie, cheat, and steal. Um, especially if they're on drugs, especially if they're on drugs, don't let them in your home because you cannot, and you want to trust them because it's your sister, it's your uncle, it's whomever, but you can't because they are, um, a slave to their addiction. They're a slave to their cycle. Um, they're a slave to their anxiety. So they'll do what it takes to get them to the place that they are comfortable again, because we all want to be in that place. And unfortunately, it takes a little bit more for them to do that. And they don't see a problem with compromising everything to get to that level of comfort. Right. So if you do put personal boundaries in your life with them, say, put your foot down, do a lot of them tend to then turn on you? Yes. Yeah. But they do it temporarily. They always come back. So you have to kind of have a tough skin. Because they'll say stuff like, oh, you never loved me anyway. You never wanted to be my friend. I know you didn't care about me. You yep. just wanted, you just wanted this. Or you, you just wanted to think you were popular. You know, they say nastiness to you. Um, but then later on, they'll come back and they'll never apologize, but they'll at least talk to you again, like uh, nothing's happened. So that's why I said they don't really have a lot of friends because it's easy to kind of se separate yourself from your friends. It's not so easy to separate yourself from your family. Exactly. Um, so that, um, they, they usually put their families through the rigor and then the families are exhausted and, and then um, they seem insensitive because they don't really want to do the family therapy again. They don't want to do the, 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 the aftercare plan where, you know, um, Tommy comes home and stays with them while they rehabilitate. They don't want to do that because they've done it already and it's always turned out poorly. So, yeah very very interesting i could talk all night i know we've gone an hour <laughs> so what okay you cover i know you said that you had a, a couple things that you definitely want to touch on we've covered a couple of them yeah uh, i think i covered everything on my little outline here so okay good. someone just only... asked, oh sorry i'm sorry someone just said what about a person with borderline personality disorder being a parent to you how should one handle that especially with past trauma due to their issues that's why i brought it up because i knew there was probably people dealing with family members you know yes you the mom yes yeah the, the mom that calls you at all hours wanting to be yeah. reinforced that they're loved that's the typical presentation of the borderline in the, in the parent role you have it more with women than men just because uh -huh. women are more tendency to be abused in ch in childhood right and 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 they react differently to that abuse um boys have a less likelihood of being pampered as well as little girls in childhood so you just predominantly if it's a man it's usually an only child mm -hmm. um and then it's usually women so it's the moms the overbearing personality driven moms that you have to contend with and um the, it's the same situation where you just have to find firm structure and boundaries this is not so much an issue when you're 22 um you know going to college or getting you forging your life it's so much more an issue when you're 28 and you have two little kids and um the husband or a wife at home right you're forming your own family unit right. and then you have this disruptive um force pushing in on you the problem is and this is this is delving more into philosophy but there is a propensity for parents to not want their children to strive beyond what they've accomplished when they are in a dysfunctional setting yeah. uh, when we have had a healthy fulfilling life we want our children to do beyond what we are capable right. of exactly. but when they have failed in life and they are a miserable um in a, in a miserable existence they want they don't want to see happiness in their child oh, um so this yeah. is odd so they keep bringing them yeah. down oh. so often they'll um 
talk them out of career choices, talk them out of relationships. Um, you might have a borderline parent who uh, tries to get you and to break up with somebody that you're in a relationship with. Um, they'll ruin your wedding <laughs> by, by causing some drama or saying they're not coming or whatever. Um, you know, they, they don't want you to be happy if they're not happy, which is unfortunate, but that is very common. Do borderline parents tend to raise borderline personality? Does it tend to carry over? Yes, I think, well, and more so mental health in general. Right. Um, I don't, I mean, one could assume I've not seen it myself because everybody who I've dealt with who's borderline, we don't diagnose personality disorder in children. It's always right. in adulthood. Okay. And when they, because teenagers are all kind of borderline, yeah. let's be honest. <laughs> so they don't really diagnose it until they're adults. Um, and when they get to that point, quite often the parents are not involved anymore. You have no interaction with them or very right. little interaction. Mm -hmm. I don't, I, I know that there's some level of destructiveness with parents, the ones that I've seen. Um, but I can't say for certain that they're borderline. I can say though, that there is a propensity for mental health to carry from uh, family, um, parents to child to, to grandchildren. So if you have a depressed mom, you're more likely to have a child who has borderline personality disorder and then gives birth to a child who has oppositional defined disorder or something else. Like that, the mental health just kind of carries. And I feel it's more of an envir environmental aspect. Um, although there has been some research that shows in the genes that some um, some people have a, a higher tendency of being prone to anxiety mm -hmm. um, than others. So uh, that being said, that they have the the sensitive children, you know. Um, but so th there could be a genetic component to mental health as well. Um, it's not really been uh, discovered yet, although they do say a lot of it's hereditary. But I think it's assumed that it's hereditary and it could, I feel it could be just as much environmental as it is um, genetic. That's so interesting. All right. I kind of want to close out just by, I know, I know you're a Christian Yeah. and um, what are some spiritual applications? If you are someone that has maybe faced neglect in your past, you know, you have baggage from your childhood. Um, what are, what are some things spiritually that can kind of help that in your opinion? <clears throat> well, um, spirituality in someone who's had a, uh, trauma, trauma in the past or someone who has borderline personality disorder, mm -hmm. uh, or even someone who has reactive attachment disorder, it's so alien to, um, to what they know because the universal commonology if that's a word i might have made that up <laughs> i don't know if that's a word I the universal up. common aspect to all of these is um inner focus so the world revolves around every single one of these individuals not to say that in a negative way it's just even as somebody who could be the most selfless person that's been greatly traumatized their trauma keeps them behind a wall Right. that no one can permeate so to bring christ in the life of someone like that is not easy because there is uh it's a whole different way of thinking um to be humbled in the eyes of the lord mm -hmm. and um to accept the gift of salvation uh without cost because so much of their life has been um with cost you know that they've had to give up there, there was always a, a, a take, a give to the take. There was never just a gift to be given um, freely uh, without any type of catch. And so um, it's hard for them to really comprehend that. And unfortunately, there is very little faith in uh, mental health these days. Even where I worked, <clears throat> where I worked was at one point years ago, specifically faith-based hmm. and over the years that just went away to the wayside to the and so you know faith and and uh therapeutic holistic intervention 
went down and medication intervention went up um to the point now that you know, where you would need a month to work with somebody through um holistic teaching and faith-based teaching now you get a week and a half of inpatient psychiatric and that's basically enough time for them to start them on new medication and evaluate the effectiveness of that medication so they don't really have time to get into those things sometimes a child will, will reach for god and lord help us if they're in a facility where there's other people that are that are faith-based and hopefully they're with somebody that has the right type of doctrine that gives them the right type of message that isn't um what they call the, those rock concert churches or yeah. whatever I you know mean, you just have to love everybody and total acceptance right. you know that right. that type of message you know, it, it, they they're not going to get um they may not even get the right gospel depending on where they're at because it's not um taught universally to the people that work there mm -hmm. <laughs> they don't really even teach a universal concept of um mental health approach to the people that work at these facilities there is no mental health training except you um you follow another nurse around for a couple of weeks usually the same nurse so you basically develop whatever traits and habits that nurse has done for however long they've worked there um and then so you have all these people doing very specific uh approaches to their um therapy uh to their one-to-one -one interaction with these with these patients and none of them are the same um none of them give the same type of um recommendations um you know when i did my one-to-one -one interaction with people i would ask them what uh what are your coping skills and they always say oh talk to a friend do journaling count to 10 you know they knew them oh. rattle them off and yeah. then i'd say okay why did you come here Oh, because I want to kill myself because my dad was uh, threatening me or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then I say, when you go back out there and your dad is threatening you again, how is counting the 10 going to help you? Yeah. You don't have an answer because mm -hmm. no one asks that question. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so if they come to you and say, well, you know, I found this Bible on the bookshelf. What can this do to help me get better? there's not many people that would have an answer for them no i didn't when i worked there i wasn't saved till after i left there i i mean i talked about that but i um i didn't know what i wouldn't have known what to tell them and i'll tell you there was very little of that going on there was very little bible in hand we did have some of the amish community there but those people were really messed up when yeah. they came in it took a lot to put an amish person in an english yeah. secular mm -hmm. mental hospital they were schizophrenic or doing something with an animal they were very messed up and right. by the time we stabilized them with medication they would take them out and put them in a we had like a, a halfway farm like it was a farm specifically for the plain community um for mental health so as soon as they were stabilized on meds they were shipped out so they were the only ones that were really interested in, in faith and they didn't get any of that in the patient unfortunately yeah i know i'm thinking of a lot that maybe have been saved later in life you know and they have um they have had problems and they want to raise their children you know better than they were raised so i know for me just being a pastor's wife i would say get in a good church you know somewhere have the community of believers to kind of help you know, help you through that. But then, like you said, a lot of these people have a hard time developing real, you know, lasting relationships. So. Yes. You know. The other issue, and this is, this is a whole other subject, Cassie, but um, the lack of, I mean, in the secular world, um, there's a lack of identity anymore. Um, there's a lack of, um, acceptance of identity unless you are taboo unless you do not conform to the gender norms and the identity norms so if you go into an inpatient setting normal you're not interesting enough and so you get ostracized very quickly so then a lot of people often make up i mean we've had so many people that went in and this was even this was five years ago this was way before the way things are now but um 
back then it was really uh, exciting and different to be called calling yourself bisexual. So yep. everyone becomes bisexual. Yep. We had a few people that were transgendered. I think three in the five years I worked there. I'm sure everybody wow. is now. Three. Yeah, just three. Yeah, just three. That was five years ago. So that tells you um, now I'm sure it's everybody. Wow. Um, sh- everybody's probably on some path or they, they want some pronoun respected. Okay. And yeah. we feed into that in the inpatient because we want them to establish trust with us so that we can make some sort of progress with them. But unfortunately, that often goes against what their parents want. And then their parents are kind of sucked into having to do the same thing where they say, okay, well, I guess it's a Zim now and yeah. not a him. <laughs> and that just makes them, so they go into adulthood kind of just questioning all of this and not really getting answers because everyone's telling them, okay, whatever you believe is okay. Right. And so how can they be Christian? if they're told whatever they believe is okay. Right. And then you go into a Christian um, mindset where that's not true, that there are very structured things that are okay and not okay. Yeah. And then they're like, but that's, that's racist. That's, that's homophobic. That's, right. uh, that's unacceptable. That, that doesn't, that doesn't, this is hate speech, you know, this just right. doesn't compute. So it's just making it even more worse. I mean, I think Christianity, I feel like if part of me is hopeful because I feel like there's a large movement in our youth that want to go back to tr- traditional values. And part of me is terrified because I feel like the other half of the youth are never going to be able to comprehend what Christianity even means because of what they're just being exposed to. Oh yeah. I can totally see that. I mean, just in the. Don't yeah. So all we can do for our parent, like, I, like you said, if we were raised poorly and how we can do better for our kids, it's just, to try to not allow them to have that type of um, independence, especially in a young age. I mean, it's, it's, the, it's a developmental state. It's why they have the terrible twos and the whiny threes. They are always pushing their limits. Mm-hmm. Um, there is a documentary called uh, Boys Alone, where they took a group of boys 10 to 12 and just stuck them in a house and they said, do what you want. No parents, do what you want. And they did the same thing with girls. And the first thing that they did, both of them, was right all over the walls. And they were watching the cameraman because they wanted to see what the, what boundaries could be pushed. They wanted to see what they could get away with. The boys trashed the place. The girls didn't. But, the, I mean, it was destruction, complete destruction. And then they hated it afterwards. Yeah. And they hated, be, they hated living there because it was so disgusting. But <laughs> they need to be told, no, this isn't. Because that's how they learn. They are always especially boys but same with girls they're always pushing the limits to see what is acceptable and if you tell them everything's acceptable that they define their own identity and their own structure then they'll never really learn anything more than that and it just is going to make them flounder they're never going to know i mean so many kids don't really know what to do with themselves they don't know where to go in life because they don't really know or haven't developed any type of personal interests because it was all about conformity yeah exactly i've seen that a lot very good very interesting so we didn't even get to a lot of um i told you i know i knew it would be that way but that <laughs> i'll have you on again hopefully after the baby <laughs> in a few months, I'll, I'll get you on again to talk about some of this other stuff and who knows we might still be in the lockdown then so we might be t- yeah. still talking about that i don't know <laughs> But no, thank you very much for coming on. I think I'm going to end it there. It was, um, we got a lot of, a lot of people were very intrigued by this in the chat. They were saying Good. it was very interesting, very informative, um, you know, especially the ones I know maybe that are dealing with people like this in their life and, you know, just kind of some things to watch out for with their own kids. You gave a couple nuggets of child rearing advice. <laughs> thank you. So, so that's Good. No, but thank you very much for coming on. Um, Just go ahead and hang out. I'm going to end the live and then I'll I'll say bye to you. But all right, guys, if you like this video, just go ahead and share it, like it, subscribe if you haven't already. And we will see you next week. Let me end the live.